So Jane, I'm happy to pray for you. Well, Father, we need you this morning. Uh, we thank you for your word. Uh, you tell us it's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And that's why we're here. We want to hear from you. And thank you for Jane. Thank you for the time that she's put into this. Thank you for how you've worked in her heart. Um, it's a hard passage. Will you use her this morning? Um, give her the words. Give her the confidence that this is your word. It will not return void. It will fulfill the purpose for which it is sent into our lives. And so, God, make us uh, open to hear what you have to share with us this morning through Jane. And um, yeah, we just, we receive with eager anticipation. Uh, give her a calm and just a, a clarity. I know she has a lot going on. Um, so just give her your presence and fill her with your spirit as she teaches. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Or do you, I, I, I like I'm going to walk. Actually. Oh, perfect. All right, good morning. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to run out right afterwards, but um, please, you know, email me or get in touch with me some other way. If you have any questions about what I'm talking about, this is a tough passage, and I, I don't know what I was thinking when I said I would do this. Not Well, the passage, I knew what I was thinking, but the date, um, I was thinking, oh, it's a week before classes, so I'm totally free, but um, there's orientation, there's graduate admissions. I, I don't know what I was thinking. Anyway. I think I pretend sometimes my life doesn't really get that long. And, um, I also last night had to speak without a microphone, so I'm a little hoarse. I'm sorry. Um, but when I was speaking last night, because I didn't have a microphone, I had to stand like in the middle of the room. And I, it, it turned out I, I thought that was really great because this is a very personal and difficult, really difficult passage. So if you don't mind, I'm going to stand here and, I don't know, pretend to be Oprah or something. <laughs> So uh, Bevy reminded us last week that the picture that we've gotten so far of David has been one of a king, and before that, an anointed prince, who was working hard to show that uh, uh, show God's love and His care um, for His people. Now, in those chapters, it was easy to look at David and say he was a type of Jesus. Our true anointed king, that is, we could look at him and say, this is a model of what the king was going to be later, because he was recorded as doing acts of hesed mercy. He was, he had, uh, he was honoring God um, as king. He sought God's will when he went to war, mostly, <laughs> most of the time. But with chapter 11, we're going to see a very different side of David, one that is, in fact, going to reverberate until the end of David's life. And even beyond, because we're going to see he's going to be unable to be the kind of husband, the kind of father, and eventually the kind of king that God called him to be. But the good news is God never gave up on him. And this should be very reassuring to you. God doesn't give up on us, nor does he ever go back on his promises to redeem us. And this is the first point of the story today. God will not give up on you if you are repentant. The second point is that God sees everything, even the things that people think they're keeping secret, but he is just as well as merciful. If you are suffering from a wrong that has been kept secret, you can know that God sees your suffering. He is a just judge as well as a merciful judge. So let's start. The chapter begins in the spring of the year, the time when kings go to battle. David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. Uh, Rabbah is their capital city. As today, you would know it as Amman in modern Jordan. But David remained in Jerusalem. So the chronology of the story is uncertain. We're not told exactly when this happened in David's reign. We don't know if he's in his midlife. We don't know if then he's undergoing a midlife crisis. <laughs> we don't know why he's not with the army. Um, he usually is. Why did he send his army out after the Ammonites? And Because it appeared in chapter 10 that they were defeated and re had retreated back into their own homeland. Was this a story happening then before Joab returned to Jerusalem? In chapter 10, verse 11, 
But the story of the battle in chapter 11 sounds like it's a prolonged siege, not a single battle. So commentators have suggested that this battle and the story of Bathsheba should be inserted between the circumstances of the battle that Joab was fighting in chapter 10, verses 8 through 11. But this is a little difficult, too, because you go back, you remember, Joab's army was surrounded by other armies. And so that would be a little difficult to be sending messengers back and forth to Jerusalem if you are surrounded. But it's so in short, we don't exactly know when this story happens within David's life, and the writer is not going to give us any details about it. Just as the writer is not going to give us a lot of details about the emotional events that are happening. These a subject and verbs come very quickly, one after the other, and there's not a lot of detail about what's going on. Now, what's, what, I, what commentators think is happening is that um, David is, uh, the writer has grouped all of the battles about, you know, the battles with the Ammonites, the battles with the Syrians in chapter 10 um, in order to have some kind of narrative community uh, continuity. You know, I'm talking about all the battles here, so I'm just going to kind of throw this one in here too, even though chronologically it doesn't quite follow. Um, or maybe the writer wanted to clump together all of the good things that David had done in the first half of the book in order to show us the pivot or the turning point about the story of Bathsheba. So let's read about what happened in this fateful spring. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, is this not Bathsheba? the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself from uncleanliness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. This is a trigger warning here. Um, this is a story about a forcible conquest of a powerless woman by a powerful man. It's an ugly story that has become all too familiar to us today. I mean, I, I, I hate to mention these names, Harvey Weinstein, Bill Cosby, Larry Nasser. I mean, you can go on, can't you? Um, and knowing all of the circumstances of the story, we can say it is a story about rape. I have to admit that um, I read some commentators who wondered if Bathsheba went up onto the roof to entice David or was honored by his attention to her. These are direct quotes. I was really put off. I was a little angry even. Um, I think John Piper has the right reading of this passage. This is not an adulterous affair. This is a one-sided power grab. And it is the rape of a woman, an act that displeased the Lord, even if he redeems the circumstances. So let me tell you why I and other commentators uh, read the story that way. So let's start with Bathsheba. She was on her roof washing, not bathing, washing. The Hebrew verb means that. So don't think of her as being stripped naked and sinking into her clawfoot tub um, in order to get clean. People did not do that in antiquity, and especially women, not, uh, not until much, much later anyway. <laughs> um, in fact, Jewish women could be divorced for showing their elbows to men outside of their family. Bathsheba clearly felt she had, so she's probably up on the roof. She may be dressed in a light linen robe or something, but you know, don't think of her as up on the roof as being naked. Bathsheba clearly felt she had some privacy. She's washing. She's probably using the rooftop cistern for, for water. Rainwater is considered in Jewish law to be living water and thus most appropriate for any kind of ritual cleansing. She would not expect to be spied upon. It's late afternoon. Um, she has this moment to herself. Why is anybody else walking around on their roof in the late afternoon? What the text implies is she was doing what's commanded in Leviticus 15, 19. Whenever a woman has her menstrual period, she will be ceremonially unclean for seven days. Anyone who touches her during that time will be unclean during the evening. The rest of the chapter in Leviticus 
notes that the way that men interact with uh, uh, how, how they cleanse themselves after interacting with items that a menstruating woman had touched. That is, if, if I as a woman was menstruating and sat down on this chair and my husband came along and sat down on it, he would be ritually unclean and would have to cleanse himself. Um, or he himself would be on pure for seven, day, uh, seven days. Um, there's no explicit statement in Leviticus that a woman must uh, wash herself to make herself ritually clean um, after her period. It would certainly be that the, the that would certainly be the ritual that would come to mind because there are so many other instances in Leviticus about the Lord directing the person to wash to become ritually clean. This may be what the writer is telling us in verse four, and you'll notice the translator puts it in parentheses because it's, it's a little bit out of chronological sequence here. She had been purifying herself from her uncleanliness. You'll notice that the phrase is put after the rape, but um, the writer wants to emphasize a couple of things by this washing. It's, so she's not cleansing herself after the, the, I mean, she may have done that, but that's not what the point of this comment is right here. She wants to emphasize a couple, he wants to emphasize a couple things. Bathsheba was an observant Jewish woman purifying herself after her menstrual period. And number two, she was not pregnant with Uriah's child when David brought her to the palace. David would have understood this because he, she is ritually washing herself after her period. Um, and you'll notice he never doubts the paternity of that child. So he knows it is not Uriah's child. So let's talk about David. Um, I will emphasize that David is not with the army as might be expected. Certainly the writer wants us to note that. Um, instead, he's apparently taking an afternoon nap in the comfort of his palace. And it said specifically, he gets up off his soft bed to take a walk in the cool breezes of his rooftop terrace. Remember, while Uriah will remind us that the army is sleeping on the ground as they are with the, uh, with, uh, the Lord in pursuing an enemy in the siege of a city. Apparently having nothing else to do, even though he's a king, <laughs> he starts spying on his neighbors. And archaeologists are cur uh, currently exploring a neighborhood in Jerusalem that they say dates to the uh, time of David. Um, and if that's true, the houses are built on a very steep slope. I, and I mean, very steep slope is in you would have to have really good calf muscles to get from the top to the bottom um, a couple times in the day. Um, so David would have probably have lived in a house that was built closest to where the temple was later built. Remember, the temple is not built in his lifetime. It's built in the reign of Solomon. Um, but the area was already set apart as being sacred. So he, he was probably close to the top of the hill, and he could have very easily looked down on the roofs of his neighbors. And remember, he would also have been surrounded by aristocrats like Uriah, because aristocrats tend to live with each other. They live in something like a gated community, as a matter of fact. So I think it's interesting that the writer tells us that David asks someone who that beautiful woman is. Remember, um, ancient Hebrew women are not supposed to interact with men outside of their households. So David, in fact, would not know her by sight. What it means for the reader is that we hear that his next actions were known to several people in the household, but David apparently doesn't care. He's told then by an unnamed person um, that she's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam. Now, what's really interesting is we have very, very few women in the Bible whose father's names we know. We don't know. We don't even know the name of Mary. Um, uh, so this the writer is signaling us very strongly about the situation that David is getting himself into. Iliam was, as we hear in 2 Samuel 23, 34, one of the mighty men of Israel. So was Uriah, we're going to find out later too. They were something like David's bodyguard. This, they would have been very close to him. There are fewer than 40 men who are mentioned as David's mighty men. 
So he would have been had very close relationships um, with all of them. And Eliam's father, Ahithophel, was a trusted counselor to David. In 2 Samuel 15, 12, we hear this. And uh, Ahithophel was still around during the conspiracy of Absalom. So when this um, unnamed informant um, mentions Bathsheba's father, that should have immediately have told David he was inquiring, and we know for terrible reasons, about a woman who had very close connections to his own group of counselors. Uriah, whose name means Yahweh is my light, is called the Hittite. We're not sure uh, why. Uh, so, so he has a very, very Israelite name centered on Yahweh, um, but he is called the Hittite, which is another people group. They are a non-Semitic people group. That is, they do not worship um, they do not come from the area that we call the Middle East today. They do not worship Yahweh. In fact, they come from the area of modern Turkey. Um, and we're not sure then how far back his in, um, in time his family origins go. So he's still called the Hittite. I, I'm, just, I'm reminded that my husband went to a small Christian school and they got a new kid in in second grade. And even when they graduated, he was still called the new kid. <laughs> So it may be something like that. His family may have been in, in Israel um, for generations and, in fact, may have been worshipped uh, Yahweh for generations, which is why he is given the name Yahweh is my light. Um, so, uh, but to me, um, hearing about Uriah the Hittite uh, is a lovely reminder that God in, always intended to bring all peoples of the world into his chosen race. Okay, but now there are more people that are going to be entering into this conspiracy. David sends messengers, notice the plural, messengers, to Bathsheba's house. We are not told what she thought when she's had these men appear at her gate. Um, what reason would there be for royal messengers to show up at her house um, at night? But she's summoned to the palace. And remember, when an ancient ruler summons you, you have no choice. You go. Um, do you remember the story of Esther? She is summoned to the palace, and she has to go. Do you remember the story of Sarah, who was twice summoned to the Pharaoh? And even though she had a husband, uh, Abram, who was powerful, she had to go to the Pharaoh's court. Rulers have the authority of life and death. Remember that Uriah is put to death in this very story for not following what the king wants. So Bathsheba can't refuse. And she's also not told why, why she's being summoned to the palace, of course. Um, so we're not told what she's being summoned for, but the result, um, I, and she, you know, she may have, maybe she thought that he was going to tell her her, son, her husband was dead or, you know, we, we like I said, we, we're just not told. Um but the result is recorded as being completely one-sided. David took her. David lay with her. This is how other rapes are recorded in this very, very spare manner um, in the Old Testament. We're going to hear one later. In fact, Ellen's going to come talk to us about the one in 2 Samuel 13, 14. But we also hear the same verb being used in Genesis 34, 2 and Deuteronomy 22, 25 and 28. You'll notice, too, the woman, the uh, writer only calls her the woman after this. It's really, uh, yeah, like I said, it's just kind of like um, at, when she very curtly informs David, I am pregnant. With the implication being the rest of the world is now going to be able to see your sin because everyone knows Uriah hasn't been home. He has been he's fighting David's war. And um, note the passage of time. We don't hear that David had any other interactions with her after that one. Um, but she would have only been able to send this message to him after she knew she was pregnant. We're talking, what, five, six weeks later at the at, uh, earliest? So the last time she saw David uh, was five or six weeks ago. So David sends word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah came to him, David asked Joab, 
asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. And then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah didn't go down to his house. David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Why didn't you go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in an open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here all today also and tomorrow I'll send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David invited him. And he ate in the pres his presence and drank, so they made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. So now we read the discouraging news that David is trying to cover up his sin by bringing Uriah home, thinking he will sleep with his wife and thus be able to explain her pregnancy. In the euphemism, go wash your feet, is taken by commentators and Uriah himself to go home and do just that. That is, go home and have sex, not wash your feet. <laughs> um, Uriah says as much, in fact, when he protests to the king, I'm not going to go lie with my wife, he says. David pretends that he wanted news from the front in order, maybe so the Uriah wouldn't get suspicious about what was, was going on. And you'll notice David tries to soothe his own conscience here already by sending Uriah out with a gift. But Uriah confounds him by remaining in the military barracks um, in the palace and then shows himself to be the true Israelite when confronted with the reason why he did that. You'll notice that the members of the court know exactly what David is doing because they report to David that Uriah did not sleep in his house. If David was sensitive to his sin at this point, he might have remem remembered that he had once lamented that God lived in a tent while he lived in a palace, 2 Samuel 7, 2. But Uriah swears by a strong oath that he is not going to go into his house while God is out on the field with the army. Now there's more discouragement. David doubles down on his plan and tries to trick Uriah into sleeping with his wife. She's only a few hundred yards away. He could probably throw a stone and hit his house. Tries to get him drunk. Well, he gets him drunk, actually. But that doesn't even shake Uriah. One can only wonder what Bathsheba was thinking this entire time. But she's really stuck between a rock and a hard place. So in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab and some of the servants of David, David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. Then Joab sent and told David all the news about the fighting and he instructed the messenger when you have finished telling all the news about the fighting to the king, then if the king's anger rises, and if he says to you, why did you go so near to the city to fight? Did you not know they would shoot from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, the son of Jerubasheth? Did not a woman cast an upper millstone on, on him from the wall, so he died at Thebes? Why did you go so near the wall? Then you shall say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and told David all uh, that Joab had sent him to tell. The messenger said to David, the men gained an advantage over us and came out against us in the field, but we drove them back at the entrance of the gate. And then the archers shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. David said to the messenger, thus shall you say to Joab, do not let this matter displease you for the sword devours now one and now another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it, and encourage him. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. 
Well, this is a, this is really a terrible portion of scripture to read. David comes up with a plan to kill his loyal counselor, whose wife he has violated, and he needs the army leadership under Joab to help him. Honest Uriah is sent back to the front lines, holding the orders of his own execution, which he apparently doesn't look at because it's been sealed by the king and it's not addressed to him. We assume that Uriah didn't uh, uh, break the seal to find out the plan that's being communicated to Joab, but it, and Joab apparently doesn't protest against losing one of the mighty men of Israel. In fact, Joab arranges things so that more men die than just Uriah. He even tells the messenger what to say to David if David was upset about these unnecessary deaths so he can be mollified. It's, it's just so hard to hear how many people David let into his own sin in order to try to cover up his own. Now, Joab did a terrible thing, but it was David who committed this murder. The writer explicitly tells us there's no one to blame but David. It says the evil that David had done, uh, the thing that David had done was evil in God's eyes. Pointed reminder, in fact, of what David said to Joab in verse 25, don't let this thing be evil in your eyes. Now Bathsheba, who you'll notice is still called the wife of Uriah, is brought to the palace after a period of mourning to become one of another of the wives of David. This is, in fact, a poignant reminder that in David, by acquiring multiple wives, shows that he was ready to indulge himself and had been since an early age. These acts of self-indulgence had grown into a web of violence, lies, murder, and would soon be followed by terrible consequences, even after David had repented. Thankfully, we're going to study that in the next chapter. Jan gets that one. <laughs> but I, I'm, and I'm going to have to leave you on this, on this real down note, in fact. Um, Bathsheba is ultimately brought to the palace. She does bear David's child as his wife. But God remembers the injustice done to her. She is only one of four women mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew, where tellingly, she is not called the wife of David. She is called the wife of Uriah. So God redeemed the deed. He did not forget it. So let's get back um, to what this story tells us about ourselves and about God. David entered into a widening circle of sin based on his own desires. God had placed him in a position of power to care for the people of Israel. And he has just failed terribly at that. Now, none of us, I, I don't know, unless I'm sitting here with Prince William or something, none of us <laughs> will ever have this kind of power or authority. Um, but we do have authority over our lives, whether they work for us or they're our children. We can, as David did, desire more markers of status in our life as we get older. It can be tempting to take advantage of our position of authority, thinking, hey, I earned this perk, you know, it was all my work that got me here. Um, but it's important to remember that God has given us all authority and all status. And Jesus never forgot that. He reminds his disciples in Matthew 28 that all authority was given to me by God in order that he could care for all the people in the world, not to wield his authority like some petty king, as Satan had tempted him to do in the desert. Jesus uses his authority to serve, to heal, to feed, and ultimately to redeem the people in his kingdom. And he tells us to serve people in the same way. Let's see what else this story tells us about Jesus. Even though we've been told that David is a wise and generous man, and sometimes he has shown himself to be that, he sometimes has done acts of hesed. This story starkly puts in front of us the fact that God's people are not to look to a human king or a human leader. Every leader fails. Every leader sins, sometimes spectacularly. Our, only our true King Jesus will rule with both justice and mercy. Only our true King Jesus 
is righteous and sinless. We need to wait to see the entire fulfillment of the kingdom after Jesus comes again, which means there will still be suffering in this world. But we can be confident that God sees all the suffering that happens in this world and will make everything right on the last day. He may be silent, but he is never absent. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, <clears throat> excuse me, when uh, we read passages like um, this one, we can wonder what your plan was. But uh, we thank you that you have revealed to us the most important part of that plan, that we have a king, a son of God and a son of man who descended from the line of David, but who was so much more than David could ever be. I pray for any of my sisters here who are suffering, who may be thinking that no one knows how much or how they're suffering. Come to them this morning with your comfort and let them know you are the all-seeing God. Even every hair of their head is numbered. You see, you know their suffering, and you entered into it when Jesus died on the cross. And I pray this for me, because I, I, I can only do that. I re, as I reflect on my life, help me to remember always who is the true authority in the world and who has given me any status or any power that I have. I pray that I use it wisely. Give me strength to put aside the temptation to abuse those under my care and make me the servant you want me to be. Father, we thank you that your word is so honest about the failings of the humans in it. Help us to remember to see ourselves in the people of the Bible, even as we come to fully understand all the promises of redemption that you've given us in the same writing. I ask, I ask now that you bless the discussions that will be happening in the small groups. I thank you for the time the sisters will spend bringing each other's concerns and prayers to you. Amen.